Hello, everyone. This is Tom Clays. I'm president of the Santa Monica Conservancy. And I wanted to thank you tonight for this, uh, joining us for the second of the 2021 Mosaic Lecture Series. Some of you are familiar with the Conservancy's mission, but for those of you that are not, the Conservancy is a historic preservation organization, much like the LA Conservancy or the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We're an educational and advocacy, advocacy group, <coughs> excuse me, that focuses on Santa Monica and the immediately surrounding area. Through our efforts for the last 18 years, we've become the leading voice in the community for embracing historic preservation and adaptive reuse while celebrating all our historic communities and their memories. We want to thank our sponsors, Boston Properties and Pankow Builders, for making this first three of the 2021 lecture series possible. Boston Properties is, a large, is the largest publicly traded uh, developer and owner of Class A properties in the United States. They have a major presence here in Santa Monica, where they own Colorado Center and Santa Monica Business Park. Pencal is a pioneer of design build and integrated project delivery, providing general contracting for commercial, educational, healthcare, residential, and tenant improvement services throughout California. I want to thank those of you that have made a donation to the Conservancy related to this lecture or have paid uh, to join us. During the program, you'll have the opportunity to donate or join the Conservancy by using the chat function. Just click on that and um, you'll um, be able to get that. So with that, um, I wanted to turn over the program to Libby Motika. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the second program in our series focusing on the history and culture of the communities who make up vital pieces of the mosaic we call Santa Monica. Today's lecture will consider the influence of the Jewish community in the development of Santa Monica. Our speaker, Stephen Sass, will trace the origins of the Jewish migration to Santa Monica and its lasting impact on culture, commerce, politics, and on Jewish life. He will offer a glimpse of the Jewish communities in Santa Monica and Venice in the 1860s. And he'll point out the existing evidence of Jewish life, including the reborn shul at the shore in Venice and the ever vital delis on Wilshire Boulevard. Sasser serves as the president of the Jewish Historical Society of Southern California, which documents and creates awareness of the history of the Jewish community dating back to 1841. He was executive producer and co-writer of Meet Me at Brooklyn and Soto, a historical society's award-winning documentary on the East LA Jewish heritage, which aired on PBS in 1996. Before I introduce or say welcome to Stephen Sass, I'd like to remind you all that you have an opportunity to ask questions following the lecture by using your Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And so with no further ado, welcome Stephen. Thanks so much Libby for that extremely generous introduction and um, uh, thank you um, for everyone for being here. Um, good afternoon. Um, first, I want to thank the Santa Monica Conservancy for hosting this talk. And particularly, I want to thank Conservancy volunteers, Steve Loper and Phyllis Dudek for all of their hard work on this program. In the time that we have together, we're going to take a whirlwind look at the Jewish history of Santa Monica, which includes the neighborhood of Ocean Park, some of us think of that as a separate community, but um, actually it's part of Santa Monica and Venice, which is a part of the city of LA and the intersection with the development of these communities. We'll really just be scratching the surface this afternoon. So my hope is that all of you will uh, join us in collecting and preserving this history, uh, adding more stories, information and images to that which we have collected for this afternoon's presentation. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, I guess that could be a nod to Rogers and Hammerstein, but even way before them, um, we're gonna start with Genesis. Um, some years ago, when I was editor of Jewish Los Angeles, a guide, my teacher, Rabbi Richard Levy of Blessed Memory, 
contributed to the book the following midrash or alternative commentary on an expansion of the traditional biblical text. His tongue was firmly planted in cheek um, when he wrote the following. When God began to draw the blueprint for the universe, the Holy One looked out at the, at the peaceful ocean, newly formed, and at all the great expanse of the land to the east of it. It won't do, said the Creator, to have all of those Jews as numerous as the sands of the seashore clustered all together. They'll form one single bland Jewish community with nothing to divide them, nothing to argue about, nothing to be angry or glad that they're not on the other side of, and Judaism will die. And so, we can have our slide. Um, God built a tiny mountain range out from the ocean to divide the city that would be founded there, saying, here I shall place a gift to all, and for the Jews of this region, that they may divide and multiply and develop one Jewish community called the city and one Jewish community called the valley. I'm one of those valleyite folks, I have to confess. Um, God placed this gift here. In Hebrew, the words are Sam Matana Khan, as a result of which the range was known in ancient times as the Sam Matana Khan Mountains. Thousands of years later, settlers of another culture, knowing the name had religious connotations, but ignorant of the original ones, assumed that it honored the mother of St. Augustine, one that it bears to this name. And so now everyone, all of you know how Santa Monica really got its name. It would actually be thousands of years before the greater Los Angeles Jewish community would actually develop in the city and even later into the valley. Jacob Frankfurt, who we, who we believe was the first Jewish resident of Los Angeles, arrived here in 1841 with the Roland Workman Party. It was an exploratory party, and he was a native of Germany and a tailor merchant. This is an idealized view of what the dusty, lawless Pueblo looked like when he arrived. Frankfurt and his peers never could have imagined that greater Los Angeles would eventually be part of the second largest metropolitan area in the country, a global center, and in fact, the second largest Jewish community in the world today outside of Israel. This is Bell's, Bell's Row, also later known as Mellis Row, um, and Frankfurt's tailor shop was located here. This was a two-story skyscraper. For Los Angeles, it was a skyscraper at the time at Los Angeles and Elisa Streets, the current site of the federal building in downtown LA. Now we're talking about these things to just kind of give you a, a bit of the origin story. Where does the Jewish community in Southern California come from? When did they arrive? And um, just a few of the basic facts. The first federal census was conducted after California joined the United States and Los Angeles became an American city in 1850. Among the 1,610 inhabitants of the city counted there, there were, including Frankfurt, eight Jewish men, or less than a minion, the Hebrew word for the quorum of 10 needed for public prayer. That's to distinguish it from the minions that you find running around at Universal Studios. Um, they all had their businesses in this building and they slept in the back of their stores, which is why I like to call this the first Jewish neighborhood in Los Angeles. Slowly, the Jewish population increased and began to develop the basic institutions necessary to sustain Jewish life in this very remote outpost. This panel from the Fairfax Community Mural shows, second from top right, the constitution and bylaws of the Hebrew Benevolent Society, the first all-purpose Jewish organization and the city's first social welfare organization of any kind. It was founded in 1854 to help both Jews and non-Jews. Today, it's called Jewish Family Service LA, and it still has the same objective, helping all. Below on the bottom right is a portrait of four generations of the Newmark family who came to Los Angeles from West Prussia in 1854. Patriarch Joseph served as the lay rabbi for the community until a rabbi could be engaged. More about daughter Sarah, who is shown here on the far right and her connection to Santa Monica shortly. At bottom left is the Southland's first professional rabbi, Abraham W. Edelman of Congregation B'nai B'rith the first permanent synagogue. 
now called Wilshire Boulevard Temple. After holding services in such places as John Temple's saloon and Judge Sepulveda's courtroom, in 1873, the congregation dedicated its first building downtown, which is shown here at the center. Los Angeles and its Jewish community continued to grow. By the turn of the century, there were about 2,500 Jews out of a total population in the city of 100,000. Many of the new arrivals were impoverished, Yiddish-speaking Eastern European Jews, often coming in search of sunshine to cure tuberculosis and other ailments. The Jewish community moved to such districts as Temple Street, Bunker Hill, and Central Avenue, and to Boyle Heights, which became the largest Jewish community west of Chicago between the wars. This is a vintage photo of Congregation Palma Torah, popularly known as the Breed Street Shul, today the last remaining of what were once 30 synagogues on the west side, and one of the primary projects in association with the Jewish Historical Society. Next is the original Cantor's Deli, which opened in Boyle Heights in 1931 and remained there until the 1970s. Its first Fairfax Avenue location opened in 1948, reflecting the post-war Jewish migration to Beverly Fairfax. And earlier, continuing the westward migration, in 1929, this became the third and one of the current homes of Wilshire Boulevard Temple on Wilshire near Western Avenue. Keep in mind that at the time, this area was still considered the far western edge of LA city limits. The temple's rabbi Edgar F. Magnin said people thought he was crazy when he built one of the first houses in Beverly Hills, then connected to Los Angeles only by a dirt road. I was crazy. I should have bought the whole block, he later reflected. Similarly, Los Angeles and the coast were quite geographically separate in those days before freeways and sprawl. But long before Santa Monica was laid out as a city in 1875, the beauty of Santa Monica Canyon for camping, picnicking, and swimming was well known to Angelinos, particularly as an escape and respite from high summer temperatures in that era before air conditioning. These are Jewish campers enjoying tent life on and near the beach. Shortly before the Jewish New Year in 1867, a local newspaper recorded that on Sunday last, almost the entire Hebrew portion of Los Angeles went to Santa Monica Canyon on a picnic excursion, conveyed to the scene of festivity by four six-horse coaches where the day was spent in the most delightful and harmonious manner. Seems like today would be a day just like that at Santa Monica Beach. Sarah Newmark, who we first met a few moments ago, married her first cousin, Harris Newmark, in LA in 1858. Harris, also born in West Prussia, had limited English language skills, but was tutored by his London-born aunt mother-in-law, Rosa, Sarah's mother, one of the founders of what's now Loyola Marymount. He also learned Spanish, which he needed in order to communicate successfully as a language of commerce. He became a successful grocery and dry goods merchant, and later he became involved in real estate and investments. At one time, the present day city of Montebello was known as Newmark, and he also owned Rancho Santa Anita, which he sold to Lucky Baldwin. Newmark's interests were very diverse, both of their interests. Sarah was primarily a leader in the synagogue and the Ladies Hebrew Benevolent Society. Harris was one of the founders of the LA Public Library and the Southwest Museum, a charter member of the Chamber of Commerce, and he helped to bring railroad service to California. He was also active in Jewish causes. His book, shown here, 60 Years in Southern California, has been called one of the great autobiographies by an American Jewish writer and the single most valuable memoir, memoir about Southern California in the 19th century. And here they are surrounded by their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. In 1875, the first auction was held for lots in the newly laid out city of Santa Monica, drawing the largest crowd of people ever seen in Southern California, as it was uh, described in a press account. The second sale that day was made to the Newmarks, who purchased a block of lots for $300 each. That's the equivalent today of only little more than $7,000 per lot. I think a pretty good deal. They were on Ocean Avenue between what's now Broadway and Santa Monica Boulevard. 
They bought them for themselves and five other prominent Jewish relatives and friends. This is the summer home that Sarah and Harris later built at 1311 Ocean Avenue. And they're sitting there on the porch. Um, and given that large family, you wonder um, how, they, uh, how they accommodated everyone. Um, the Newmarks were so well known in town that their exact street address wasn't needed on this 1909 postcard. I wish we had the same ability today. This is a shot of Third Street between what's now Broadway and Santa Monica Boulevard in 1891. It's roughly the location of today's Third Street Promenade. Jews joined together in establishing saloons and stores catering to both local residents and tourists. Two of the Third Street merchants were the Roth brothers, Norman and Myron, who came here from Illinois. Together, they took over a general store and offered groceries and dry goods. Norman was elected a city trustee in 1894, and he was reelected in 1898. Parenthetically, I should add that as in Los Angeles, while Jews and other minorities were elected to public office in the pioneer period, they were soon to be excluded from politics and other social networks in the early 20th century due to the prejudices of later arrivals, a situation that wouldn't change until after World War II. Jews were also involved in um, bringing tourists to the Santa Monica Bay Area. Um, this is the Hotel Arcadia. It opened in 1887, it has 150 rooms, but it soon met financial difficulty and was sold shortly after to Henry Kowalski, a prominent San Francisco Jewish attorney. The Arcadia was popular, popular with Jewish vac vacationers and visitors from up and down the West Coast and beyond. By the 1890s, Several Jewish families were also renting cottages for the whole summer season. Another of the early merchants was Abraham Musser, who arrived in 1891 and took over a bankrupt store, soon specializing in dry goods and clothing. Musser, who was born in Bavaria, was a Confederate veteran who almost died at the Battle of Shiloh. Here are two of his seven children, Edna and Joseph, in front of the store in 1900. The family belonged to Congregation B'nai B'rith and the Santa Monica Outlook noted in 1891 that, quote, A. Mooser closed his place, of a business, his place of business on Monday on account of a due celebration of the Day of Atonement. Abraham was also active in civic and political life. He served as the president of the Santa Monica Democratic Club, and he was master of ceremonies at the banquet that celebrated the arrival of the Santa Fe Railroad to Santa Monica in 1892. He was also on the city council appointed committee that established Woodlawn Cemetery, although he and his wife Henrietta and son Joseph are buried at Home of Peace in East Los Angeles. And this is their 25th wedding anniversary celebration in 1899. This is Carolyn Mooser, the Mooser's seventh and last child. She was born in 1892, and she was the first Jewish child born in Santa Monica. She became a teacher at the Washington Street School in Venice, due in part to her father's friendship with Venice founder, Abbott Kinney. Speaking of education, this is the Santa Monica Canyon School, which opened in 1894. In 1894, it was part of the Santa Monica School District. It still serves the community as part of LAUSD. Minna Norton, a member of a large, uh, pioneer Los Angeles Jewish family was its first teacher. She's at the center of the photo. And now we'll see a close-up of, of Mina, who had just graduated the same year from the State Normal School. Canyon School was her first teaching position. Santa Monica businesses actively sought to reach Jewish customers by advertising in the B'nai B'rith Messenger, which was then LA's Jewish newspaper. This 1912 issue of the paper had a special section which highlighted Santa Monica and its Ocean Park neighborhood, which Abbott Kinney had begun to develop in 1891. This is Rabbi Sigmund Hech. He was the senior rabbi of Congregation B'nai B'rith from 1899 to 1919. Since many of his congregation, um, uh, he had many members of his congregation, they were largely longer settled, more prosperous American-born Jews and they were spending their summers in Santa Monica, Ocean Park, or Venice. So he decided since attendance 
downtown at the synagogue was more flagging during the summer to conduct the first Jewish religious services in the Bay Cities during the summer of 1912 at the Masonic Lodge on Marine Street in Ocean Park and later at Eagle Hall on Pier Avenue. He noted that the beach cities were also the summer, as he called it, rendezvous of many of our co-religionists from Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and other states. This article notes that when Rabbi Heft first broached the idea of summer Sabbath services at the beach, there was some opposition and no encouragement whatsoever. He went ahead anyway, and services were always well attended, attracting between 75 and 125 people each week. By the 1910s and 20s, Ocean Park and Venice gained tremendous popularity as a weekend and summer destination for LA's working and middle classes. This is Rebecca and Isaac Rubenstein with their children, Francis and Harold, visiting Venice Beach in the 1920s. They took the streetcar from their Temple Street home. By that time, there were also several hundred permanent Jewish residents living in Venice and Ocean Park. These were more recently arrived Jewish immigrants. They were less affluent, they were more religiously traditional or ideologically secular, but not assimilated. And they were more visibly Jewish in their language, namely Yiddish, in their accents, in their dress, and in their vocations. Sometimes this triggered anti-Semitism among Angelinos, as well as embarrassment from the more established Jewish community. The Jewish immigrants felt less welcome at the Santa Monica Beach, and over time, the Ocean Park Beach became known as Oshini Beach. Shini was then a derogatory term for Jews. The permanent Jewish residents in Venice and Ocean Park were primarily working class and small scale merchants living and working all within three blocks of the beach and at the most within three quarters of a mile. This is the 1936 notice in the evening outlook of a Works Project Administration Yiddish theater troupe. It was performing at the Ocean Park Municipal Auditorium. Erwin Diller, who I believe is in our audience this afternoon, uh, tells us that his, uh, his father had Joe's Candy and Cigar Store from 1938 to 1950 on the boardwalk in front of the Dome Theater and a few yards from the Ocean Park Amusement Pier, which was the predecessor to Pacific Ocean Park. Ocean Park Pier was one of eight amusement piers then along the two miles of beach from Venice to Ocean Park. It's estimated that by 1947, at least a third of the concessions on the Ocean Park Pier were owned by Jews. Beginning in the 1930s, Venice and Ocean Park also became home for older Jewish immigrants, many of them retired garment workers, who were drawn by affordable rents in pre-war apartments and cottages and the pleasant coastal weather that was available year round. The Workmen's Circle, the Emma Lazarus Club, and various Zionist, socialists, and discussion groups were plentiful, and Yiddish culture flourished, so much so that the Ocean Park Ranch Library had a large collection of books in Yiddish. By 1950, several synagogues, kosher bakeries, butcher shops, and delis gave these neighborhoods a Jewish identity, intensified because there's no automobile traffic along Oceanfront Walk. It was said that the community had the Shansta Yiddishkeit, or in Yiddish, the most beautiful sense of Jewishness outside of New York. The Bay City's first synagogue, Congregation Mishkon Tefilo, is the translation of the Hebrew is the dwelling place for prayer, was founded in 1917 as an Orthodox congregation on the border between Ocean Park and Venice. Before the congregants had their own building, they gathered in a rented hall on Fraser Pier in Ocean Park. And here they are, um, they're marching, uh, they're having a dedication day parade down Main Street to Mishkan Tefilo's new sanctuary in 1948. And here's the ribbon cutting ceremony that day. Um, from the appearance of the building, and we can see the, the um, next slide. Um, from the appearance, it looks like it predates 1948, but actually that's not the case. It's just the architecture. Um, it's been a conservative congregation since 1952, 
And I love the sign inside the Pacific facing lobby, which encourages people to recite the traditional blessing on seeing the ocean, uh, which is easily visible when those white doors at the top of the steps are opened. The blessing is blessed be the Holy One who gave us the great sea. Now, you may wonder uh, why was the first synagogue founded in Venice, not Santa Monica? Because while the pioneer Jewish families summered in Santa Monica, there were few full-time Jewish residents, likely due to socioeconomic factors. And those who did live in Santa Monica, except for those living in Ocean Park, were willing to travel by streetcar or automobile to services in Los Angeles on the Sabbath and holidays, unlike the more traditionally observant in Ocean Park in Venice who walked to synagogue. Also, while Santa Monica didn't officially restrict Jews or non-whites, unlike other local communities, there was nonetheless a perception that they weren't welcome. It wasn't until 1931 that Temple Emet, a reform congregation led by Rabbi David Licknates, was started with high holiday services in the Unitarian Church, followed by dedication of its own building on Wilshire Boulevard in 12. And I should add that when we mentioned the Unitarian Church, many of the synagogues um, borrowed the facilities of churches in Santa Monica and Venice in order to meet until they could be established. Um, one more sign of interfaith cooperation. This article is about Temple of Met's celebration of Hanukkah in 1932. And the headline, Jew Festival Opens Tonight, I think is a good example of both that era and the Evening Outlook's love-hate relationship with the Jewish community. More about that in a few moments. Temple Amet only lasted a couple of years. In 1939, Santa, Monica, Santa Monica's Beth Shalom Temple, a reform congregation and the forerunner of today's Beth Shir Shalom was started. Rabbi Magnin of Wilshire Boulevard Temple helped the group organize. Charles Shotland, who was the guest speaker at the second service, was the executive secretary of the Federation of Jewish Welfare Organizations, the prede predecessor of our Jewish Federation. And he was later commissioner of social security and president of Brandeis University. Here's the 1941 groundbreaking for Beth Shalom at 19th and California, where the congregation has remained ever since. Film mogul Louis B. Mayer was one of the contributors to the original building fund. And this is Beth Shir Shalom's exterior as it appears today. And here's a, a, the interior of the main sanctuary showing the, the bima or the pulpit. Uh, the particular style of, of Beth Shir Shalom Given the time it was um, built, it kind of reflects to me a, a Quaker meeting house. Um, and synagogue architecture really has no specific requirements. Um, we need a place called the Holy Ark or the Aron HaKodesh for the Torah scrolls at the center. Uh, we need an eternal light uh, to remind us of God's presence. Uh, we like to have a window so that we uh, don't shut out the outside world. But otherwise, synagogues uh, reflect the times the budget of the congregation, um, the architecture of the particular place. In the meantime, while the local community was organizing, um, world events were also having their, their impact. This is Greta Garbo at Wright with Berthold and Salka Viertel. Berthold was a screenwriter and director and Salka was an actress and a screenwriter. They came to Hollywood in 1928, only planning to stay for about three years, but with the rise of Nazism, they decided to remain. Salka became a confidant, and some say the lover, to Garbo, and she co-wrote several scripts for Garbo's films. The Viertel's house in Santa Monica was the gathering place for the emigre community and the site of salons with home-cooked meals and intellectuals and artists. Some of them included Bertolt Brecht, Charlie Chaplin, the Fielkfongers, Aldous Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, the Mann brothers, the Mann brothers, I should say, and Arnold Schoenberg, many of whom lived nearby here on the West Side. Salka's activism led to the establishment of the European Film Fund, a Hollywood effort to rescue Jews and others in danger from the Nazis. She was later branded a communist sympathizer. You'll be able to hear much more about the Viertels and the other emigres at a Santa Monica Conservancy program to be presented by Libby later this year. This is a shot of their former home as it looks today uh, in Santa Monica. This is how it appears, quite enchanting. 
And uh, this is the cover of Salka's fascinating memoir, Vienna, Berlin, Hollywood, A Theatrical Life. After World War II, the Bay City's Jewish population began to grow. Some were Holocaust survivors. This is Ben Ginsberg, Ocean Park's Ben the Barber, who was imprisoned by the Nazis for six years. He moved here with his wife Hilda in 1948 and opened Ben's Barber Shop on Main Street in 1957 over, surprisingly, the anti-Semitic protests of local bigots. He was forced to retire only because gentrification tripled the shop's rent, and he only charged $3.50 for a haircut. He often gave free haircuts to kids from poor families. By 1951, the Jewish population in the Bay Cities was approximately 3,500 to 4,000 households, and it had developed its own infrastructure, including a Jewish community council, a Jewish community center, and Jewish family service, all then separate from their Los Angeles counterparts. This is the Bay City's JCC, with its Jane Golden-designed Hester Street mural, formerly at 26th and Santa Monica Boulevard. It closed in 2002 after 65 years of service amidst a financial crisis that faced the JCCs citywide. This article is one of the responses from the Jewish community to an attack by the Evening Outlook against the Santa Monica Town Hall and the JCC, which was its sponsor, during the height of the McCarthy era in 1952. The Outlook charged that the forum had become a platform for the left wing and that, quote, there is no one on the program discussing public affairs who is not decidedly hostile to the American system of free enterprise. It added that, quote, the Jewish people who started Town Hall include a majority of the local business people who should believe in our system. According to the Outlook, the objectionable speakers included, included Senator Hubert Humphrey, who, quote, speaks for the left wing of the Democratic Party and for nothing else, Bishop G. Bromley Oxnum of the Methodist Church, quote, a fellow traveling pinko who has been identified with numerous communist fronts and is a better socialist than he is a clergyman, and, doc, and writer Dr. Max Lerner, a leading exponent of socialism. By the late 19th century, Jews were increasingly excluded from LA's oldest and most prestigious downtown social clubs, many of which they had helped to found. Several of these clubs also had beach locations in North Santa Monica, including the Jonathan Club, the only beach club that didn't discriminate against Jews and others in its membership policies was the Sand and Sea Club on the property of the former Marion Davies estate. It's fitting, I think, that the Annenberg Community Beach House, which provides public access to all, opened on the site of the former Sand and Sea in 2009. Ocean Park served as a buffer zone before the private beach clubs and lavish, between the private beach clubs and lavish houses of worship, uh, uh, last, not houses of worship, I guess they were sun worshiping, but the lavish, ha lavish houses of movie stars up north and the, de the declining area of Venice to the south. As a working class neighborhood of Santa Monica, Ocean Park was a haven for blacks, gays and lesbians and Jews for Muscle Beach and for various illegal and semi-legal activities. Beginning in the mid 1950s, the city of Santa Monica began to aggressively pursue a different vision, one of so-called urban renewal, resulting in the wholesale displacement of these communities, including an estimated four to 6,000 mostly elderly Jewish residents with a devastating impact on their lives and their culture. In 1965, the Jewish community opened the Israel Levin Senior Adult Center at the northern end of Oceanfront Walk in Venice to provide a lifeline for the remaining seniors. It's today operated by Jewish Family Service LA. It's shown here during the roller skating craze of the late 1970s. Note the contrast between the passing carnival that is Venice, including the scantily clad skaters, and the seniors sitting in the foreground who dress as though they're still in Eastern Europe, or at least on the East Coast. The Levin seniors, many of them veterans of labor unions and progressive politics, are a, are a feisty bunch. We fight to keep warm is how one described the group. Here, they march for enforcement of the boardwalk's pedestrian-only zone. They did so because one of their members was struck and killed outside the center by a passing bicyclist. 
in defense, the bicyclist said that he didn't see 84-year-old Anna Gerber, even though she was directly in front of him. The march was as much the seniors' protest against their overall invisibility in a youth-obsessed society. As part of a collaborative project on aging and ethnic groups, the late Dr. Barbara Meyerhoff, a gifted anthropology professor at USC, studied, recorded, and interpreted the center members' unique way of life, which otherwise would have been lost. In the process, she also reclaimed her own Jewish heritage. As an undergrad, I was fortunate to interview, interview her for this Daily Trojan article, but I hope that you can't make out the year. Dr. Meyerhoff and a senior are walking here on, Venice, on ocean front, uh, Venice's oceanfront walk. She said that everyone has a story and these stories told to oneself and others can transform the world. Here's Lynn Littman at Center during production of Number Our Days, a documentary on the Levin seniors that she directed and produced based on Dr. Meyerhoff's fieldwork. It won an Oscar in 1977. The seniors, of course, were nonplussed. Of course, any film about us would win an Academy Award, they said. Littman went on to direct Testament and other award-winning features in television. This is Dr. Meyerhoff's book, which was published in 1979. Uh, this is actually the paperback version. And um, it's interesting, the subhead that says, culture and community among elderly Jews in an American ghetto, which was how Venice was being described by that point, or at that point. Uh, and the work even um, inspired this play, a center theater group uh, production at the Taper in 1982. It was produced by the late Gordon Davidson. What we would call the well-loved center building um, has just been replaced by this striking new addition to the Venice Boardwalk, Jewish Federation's Bar Center at the Beach which will be an intergenerational destination that will have its grand opening after the pandemic is over. Just a couple blocks south is the Shul on the Beach, Pacific Jewish Center, the last remaining synagogue on the Venice Boardwalk. This Shul almost closed in the 1970s, but has since had a rebirth as a vibrant center of tradition, attracting a mix of younger and older people. Today's other Bay Cities congregations include Chabad of Santa Monica on 17th Street, which opened in 1973, Santa Monica Synagogue, a Reform congregation on Broadway founded in 1981, Kilat Marav on 21st Street, a conservative congregation also founded in 1981, the Living Torah Chabad on Wilshire, and the open temple on Electric Avenue, note the sign that says open your temple. And um, this is the temple, the open temple's bus uh, with the slogan, re-enchanting Judaism. Uh, the bus seems to me to be inspired by the Partridge family, but I don't wanna date myself or anything. Um, we don't have a, a photo, but there's another uh, recent arrival. It's the Kul Shul, which is described as, self-described as a, Jewish Universalist Congregation. This slide demonstrates some of the many cultural assets located in Santa Monica that benefit the entire region and in which Jews have had the opportunity to play a role. It underscores for me the notion that everyone benefits when all are welcome to participate and contribute their talents and their resources. Now, speaking of cultural assets, what's any culture without food? This is the Santa Monica Glot Kosher Market on Santa Monica Boulevard, just a stone's throw over the border in West LA. And while this sign on Wilshire is sadly all that's left of Zucchi's delicatessen, it has another important legacy, Jewish Family Service LA's Soba Food Pantry, which was the brainchild of the deli's late owners, Zucchi and High Altman. They knew firsthand the plight of those who are hungry and poor and in need of free groceries, personal care items and connection to community resources. And as a result, they gave birth to uh, SOVA, which continues to serve the community. So I want you to have heard it here first that Santa Monica is the Delhi capital, is the Delhi capital, not only of Southern California, but I think of the world with four delis on Wilshire within blocks of each other. 
pressing, that's Yiddish for eating with gusto, uh, from west to east on Wilshire Boulevard. There's Froman's, Bagel Nosh, Izzy's, and Wexler's. And while we haven't had the opportunity to do much sinning during the pandemic, since optimistically it looks like it's coming to an end, no doubt we'll make up for lost time. And so the local Jewish community expects to resume a long standing tradition this fall. When many congregations from all over Los Angeles gather at Santa Monica and Venice beaches on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, for a ceremony called Tashlich, literally casting off. We cast off breadcrumbs, bird seed, pebbles, or twigs, symbolizing our sins of the past year, and we symbolically cast them into the ocean. And here we have Santa Monica Synagogue's observance of this ancient custom. We continue to have hope in the future, exemplified, I think, by this rally by Muslim and Jewish teens on the Third Street Promenade, part of a group named New Ground. They're calling for unity, dialogue, mutual respect, and peace for all, something I'm pleased to say that clergy, congregations, and people of goodwill in the Bay Cities have been working at together for a very long time. And finally, of course, we long for the return of Hanukkah and Santa Monica at the Civic. Sam Matana Khan, a great gift was indeed placed here. Thanks so much. Stephen, wow, what a wonderful, complete, total tour of the Jewish community and the tenacity of the community. And I, I reflect on Rabbi Heft who said, we'll have a service at the beach and everyone scoffed. Ha, look what happened. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to my congregation. <laughs> <laughs> I know well, what's now, best for them. Right, now we, it's time for some questions. I, I can, I'm gonna see if there are any. So far, no, so we're just gonna present one. I'll think of something to ask you. Uh, somebody's Frank uh, Gruber to all panelists, wonderful talk. Uh, will it be recorded? Yes, it will. It will probably be available uh, towards the end of the week or early next week. Uh, for audience, remember, remember to use the Q&A if you have something to say or questions. I see that people are using the chat box. Um, we have a comment from Carol Felixen who says, I'm a member of Mishkan Tefila, thank you for mentioning it. And uh, See, that's the danger when we mention one, you know, we, we have to get all of them because yeah. we're, uh, we're going to get comments. We say two Jews, three opinions. So <laughs> we have a, 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 a hats off from Mark Wanamaker. He says, Stephen, great talk, very condensed and concise. Uh, we have a question from Carol Agate. Is the synagogue on Venice Beach still Orthodox? Yes, it is still Orthodox. Um, it's a, a traditional synagogue. Um, and so it is Orthodox, but it's very welcoming um, and um, uh, very engaging. So um, I encourage you to, to visit. I wonder if any of the community, uh, the Jewish community, church, school, synagogues, uh, welcome non-Jews. Yeah, so certainly our services are always open to anyone who wants to come. Unfortunately, these days um, uh, there have been violent in incidences. And so sometimes, unfortunately, we have to have a security presence outside, which doesn't seem so welcoming. But notwithstanding, yes, absolutely. And um, people are usually try to kind of guide people through what's going on. Um, in addition, um, many synagogues, most synagogues are welcoming to interfaith families um, where one partner may be Jewish, one may not be. Um, and so there's really an attempt to reach out and to, um, you know, to really welcome and embrace everyone. Uh, and certainly our organizations um, are open and, and serve everyone, um, you know, without discrimination, um, you know, just trying to better the community. Uh, there's a follow-up on the uh, practice. Uh, is Bet Shalom still reform? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, do you have any, this is from Murray Levy, do you have any pictures of the open-air trams that used to run along the Venice boardwalk? I don't, but I'm 
and I know that they were very popular. In fact, my mom, I told her about this talk and she said that she remembers when she came to California riding on them. Um, uh, I'm sure others of you um, do have photos. And going back to Mark Wanamaker, Mark is an amazing historian and documentarian of the film history of Southern California. And he would, you know, if he hasn't done a program, he's, he's an amazing resource. So he's been Mark, very helpful to us. Thank Mark, you. Mark, it's nice to know that you're watching. Uh, Mark has another uh, comment. He said, one of my grandmothers lived in Ocean Park when she arrived from Chicago after World War II. Wow. Uh, this is from Martha, Marsha. Thank you. As always, you managed to cover a lot of history in an enchanting way. Marsha Josephi. Oh, thank you, Marsha. From Philip Schwartz. It appears that you have forgotten to mention the Malibu Jewish Center and Synagogue. My wife and I were founders. Thanks. So um, I didn't neglect it. We, we really set a, a limit because there's such a wealth of information to just concentrate on the city of Santa Monica and Venice. And so we left out Pacific Palisades and Kilat Israel, the Reconstructionist congregation there. We unfortunately left out Malibu um, uh, Jewish Center and Synagogue, also a Reconstructionist congregation in Malibu. And also I would say that many people, uh, because the borders are so porous, People in Santa Monica, we have several synagogues on the periphery, Wilshire Boulevard Temple on Olympic, and then also um, is now being um, joined with University Synagogue in Brantwood. So there's a lot of kind of going back and forth. So we want to be inclusive of everybody. No one was left out intentionally, but we were trying to kind of limit the focus. Uh, do you have any information about how Arcadia Bandini de Baker interacted with the early Jewish community? No, but I would love to learn more about that. That sounds pretty interesting. Yes. Uh, um, let's see. This is pr pretty great. The picture of the Mishkan parade includes my grandfather, Charles Brodsky. Oh! Uh, in 1948, that was one of the comments. That's fantastic. Lest you forget, there's another Jewish deli on Wilshire, New York Bagel. Oh. <laughs> I'm so Must sorry. Must be brand new. So it's... it's even reinforcing my points with five delis now. <laughs> Thank you, um, I apologize. Tell us a bit about Isaiah Hellman and his pals from Bavaria. So Isaiah Hellman was one of the early um, developers of, you know, of the Jewish community and of Southern California. Um, he came here from Bavaria as did so many of those early pioneers. Um, and he was considered the leading citizen of Southern California. He also had a home, a uh, summer home in Santa Monica, and um, he was kind of this Renaissance man, um, started um, working in his cousin's um, stationery store, and then dry goods, and then um, started storing gold dust, and eventually opened oh. the first successful bank, uh, the Farmers and Merchants Bank, and um, there's a wonderful book about that. I recommend uh, Towers of Gold, it's by his great granddaughter, and it tells the whole story of Hellman and the family and everything he did in Southern California. Interesting. Uh, speaking of books, is it possible to see Number Our Days online? Can you say a bit more about Barbara Meyerhoff's work and what ground it broke? So it was, it, it, um, the book is available. I, I looked today thinking if someone might ask. Um, um, it's available as, uh, for reference at the Santa Monica Public Library, but LAPL and UCLA have it. We also have it in our collection at the, um, at the Jewish Historical Sites Archive at the American Jewish University. Um, but the film is not so available. Um, but this kind of lets me tease and say that we do a, um, a walking tour. The Jewish Historical Society does a walking tour each summer. Uh, we have, didn't do it last year, but hopefully we'll get to resume it again. Um, of Jewish um, Ocean Park Venice. And uh, as part of that, we show the film. And um, last summer, um, or two summers ago, we were um, really fortunate. Um, um, Barbara's family, Barbara passed away tragically at age 49, um, but um, her family joined us for the, for the tour, which was really phenomenal. So um, uh, the book is available and um, I encourage you to read it. And her, it her work was groundbreaking because anthropologists always 
studied very exotic peoples. Um, they would, she uh, had studied uh, people in Mexico. Um, it was not typical to study your own people. And um, in fact, she had planned originally to study uh, Chicanos at, in East LA. Um, that was at the time at self-described. Um, and when she went to meet with them, they said to her, why are you studying us? Why don't you study your own people? And she said, well, who are my own people? Uh, and they said, well, you're Jewish, aren't you? And she thought back to when much earlier, over a decade earlier, she'd been a social worker in Ocean Park, then as she also described as Oshini Beach. And um, she thought, hmm, I'm going to wander down there. And she did. And um, that kind of created this amazing odyssey for her. And uh, it really also transformed her own Jewish identity. Quite unusual for an anthropologist. Uh, Debbie Bernstein, you mentioned a mother-in-law educated in London, the mother of the Jewish daughter. Who was the founder of Loyola Marymount? I'm confused. Can you explain? Sure. Um, that's Rosa Newmark. So she was, um, uh, in the first panel, you saw Joseph Newmark with three of his, do his daughter, Sarah, his granddaughter, and his great-granddaughter. Rosa was not pictured. Uh, but Rosa uh, and Joseph came from Bavaria, or from Prussia, I'm sorry. And um, Rosa was, she did not, he came from Prussia. She came from London. And um, she then, when she moved here, was a founder of St. Vincent's College, which is oh, the predecessor yeah. Of, yeah. of Loyola Marymount. Yeah. Um, is the Newmark family an ancestor of the man who started Craigslist? Oh, interesting question. <laughs> I don't know. We, we need to get him on our list. Um, <laughs> right, right. Um, Mishkan's new rabbi, Josh Katzen, grandparents were founding members of Mishkan. His parents were also married there. Just to comment. Great. No, that's great. Um, there's actually, this will never end. There's another deli. There's also Main Street Bagels, although it's not really a de deli. But since I... Uh, love Joy Bagels closed many, closed many years ago, killed by Noah's Bagels. I, I would argue that there are no good traditional chewy bagels left on the West Side. Okay. Everybody said, has opinions, their favorite bagel. Opinions. Um, we could do a whole program, I think, on the delis. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. And, and places for good bagels. Right. There used to be a film about Ocean Park history available on YouTube. Can you find it now? It has interviews with delightful people of the neighborhood and Ben the Barber. Know anything about that film? I don't, but I would love to see it. Well, that brings us to the end of this fascinating q and I, I think if I had another half hour, we would just keep going and going. But alas, we need to get going and say goodbye and thank you. And I'll turn it over to Tom, who uh, will have some final thoughts. Thank Thanks you so much, very Brittany. much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen. It was wonderful. We really appreciate your time and effort. I also want to thank all the members of the program community, including everybody that worked on this, uh, Steve Loper, Libby Motika, Phyllis Dudick, and Allison Knight. Thank you very much. We can't do these programs without you. You know, I say this every time, but I really mean it. We can't do this without you. We want to again thank Boston Properties and Pankow Builders for their sponsorship, making these programs possible. And please watch for our next lecture in the series. That'll occur on June 9th, and it's gonna feature Jaime Cruz, a professor at Santa Monica College, who will talk about the historic presence of Mexicans in the Pico neighborhood. And if you liked what you heard today, please share our lecture information with friends and family. As, as Libby mentioned, our lectures, and there are quite a few of them, are available online. Uh, just go to our website, www.smconservancy.org, and follow the events uh, uh, drop down, and you'll find them there. So again, thank everybody. We had a booming crowd tonight. Thank you all for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. Good night.